When we had left, a religious cult had broken into Bionational and allowed themselves to be impregnated by facehuggers, creating an outbreak on Earth. Meanwhile, Newt and Hicks were descending onto the alien homeworld to recover the marines and detonate a nuclear bomb to destroy the hive. Bueller and his men went back into the hive to help the mercenaries who were trying to kill them in the first place. On their way out, Bueller was attacked from behind by a xenomorph who ripped him in half to reveal that he was a synthetic. We head back to Newt and Hicks. She is crying while Hicks is trying to calm her. He tells her that he tried to keep her away from all of them. He explains that this is why the marines had gone back into the hive. Their principal function is to essentially preserve human life. He tells her that they were engineered just for this mission. They spent their whole lives locked in a marine compound, waiting for this moment. He goes on to say that they are cost efficient and expendable, as we see them getting ripped apart by xenomorphs. He explains that the program has designed them to socialize, eat and talk like us, due to problems they had with earlier models, which were always a bit twitchy. Stevens was trying to tell Massey this before he was executed. Newt asks him why he didn't tell her any of this, and Hicks says that she wasn't supposed to fall in love with one of them. He goes on to say that he couldn't jeopardize the mission just for her. And she responds by saying that he is dead inside, like the aliens, and like that SOP Massey who she had shot earlier. The marines are dragging the top half of Bueller as he screams Newt's name. Hicks is able to touch down and allow the marines to jump on board. Newt then tells him to launch, but he is determined to activate the warheads. The group hear a clanking sound on the outside as they realize the aliens are trying to get in. The xenomorphs are using their tough skin and claws to rip through the exterior of the ship. Hicks is about to launch, but realizes the aliens have cut the external feed, which control the telemetry and launch functions. Newt approaches Beulah, and he tells her not to look at him. She is trying to ask him how he could keep this from her, but can't find the words. He asks her if it even matters anymore, before telling her to leave him alone and let him pretend a few more seconds. The aliens are doing some serious damage to the ship as the metal begins to cave in. We see one of them punch its head through the wall. A marine is about to fire, but is stopped by Hicks who tells him to save Anna for when they might need to kill themselves. At that moment, a bright flash of light shines in through the hole the alien had created. There is no sound outside anymore. The marines are confused, but we can see that the aliens have been taken out by a space jockey. Now this is what I was referring to earlier. The movie Alien had us all wondering what the large space jockeys were. Prometheus came out almost three decades later and explained that they were engineers who were actually wearing masks. But as I said, this was written shortly after the movie and is why they have taken it in a different direction. Hicks and Newt exit the lander and she tells us it has dead eyes. It had destroyed all the aliens, but Newt explains it didn't do it for them. She asks it why, and it is revealed that although it did not speak, something exploded inside her head, bright like a million suns. She tells us that images boiled up from a deeper place, the same plane as primal instinct, with hunger, pain, fear, and hatred. We are then transported to before the outbreak on Hadley's Hope. She tells us that there were 159 of them on LV-426, and that the company had sent her family to investigate a magnetic surge at a particular quadrant. We can see her in the back with her brother as her parents both suit up. Her mother comments on how something this big could have gone without notice until now. Her father responds by saying it was sheltered by natural rock formations and that it didn't matter as it belonged to them now anyway. Newt can see and hear her parents on the monitor. We can see that they've spotted a hole in the hull of the ship. They then proceed inside to discover that everything is smooth and feels organic. She tells us that they had terraformed the barren rock into a viable, life-sustaining planet, battling time, space and all the elements, winning in the process. This had essentially made them fearless. We see them find the body of a space jockey as Newt questions whether it was the same arrogance that got this space jockey killed. We return to the current time. The space jockey that is with them was able to telepathically access her mind and it knew that she had seen the wreckage and they now shared a grotesque form of empathy. Hicks is worried asking what it's doing to her and Newt tells him that it wants her to know she explains that she was able to pick out bits and pieces like someone changing the channel on a TV. The jockey described a mission one of them was on, carrying alien eggs on a ship. 
She freaks out as she begins to remember these were the things that attacked her father. She tells us that the pilot of the cargo vessel had lost control of the ship and crashed here. His plan was to drift off forever, carrying the aliens into the hell of deep space. The ship had crashed there instead, where the spores lay dormant until new blood had come. The space jockey is watching over the group while they repair the ship. The marines are fixing the antenna and trying to patch up the hull. Newt is seated on the ground and tells us that when you are young, you can't understand evil. It's an intangible thing, like the air or the sky, and just as pervasive. She had wanted to believe that there was something better and that there was some kind of hope. She tells us that it just watched them with its dead eyes. She explains that it had come to the alien homeworld out of hate. It had rescued these guys in the name of revenge. She goes on to say that perhaps evil is the only universal truth. We head back to Earth, where we can see the government's chief geneticist, Orina. He tells us that he had lost time since the binational attack, and has barricaded himself in his office to give him time to prepare his final report. He explains that the alien queen is able to communicate in some subconscious fashion with other species as well as her own. In humans, this communication seems to manifest in the form of nightmares. At first, they had thought that they would be able to contain the spore, and believe that the infestation seemed limited to a narrow geographical range. Yet, for every cluster they had found, there were ten more just like it. We can see the army going through, killing and burning every sign of the infestation. Orina tells us that the alien subconscious bait transcended class and political boundaries, and that they were finding hives everywhere because of this. With each new discovery, their hope of destroying the creatures before they entered the civilian population faded. Using the research from BioNational's files, they learned that the queen had gestated a number of weeks prior to maturation. Using this experiment as a baseline, he had assumed they still had time before any new queens would become viable. He was wrong. Their worst mistake was underestimating the sheer instinctual cunning of the creatures. They couldn't see the underlying pattern behind their evolutionary process. The way that every facet of their existence was geared towards propagation, as the queens matured at whatever speed their survival required. They assumed that the gestation period was time for the alien embryo to feed and grow. But it was more than that. It was an opportunity for the unknowing host to spread its paws to other sites. There was a geometric perfection to the infestations. Each queen would lay eggs of more queens, and with every generation, the spore became more entrenched. He then hears a thump outside his door, as the sound of inevitability looms closer. The cities are beginning to break down as he tells us civilian authority was weak in the face of devastation. They essentially welcomed the military coup, which was the last attempt of containment. They created testing centers where physicians would check civilians for signs of the alien infestation. Although the tests were voluntary at first, we are told that it had become mandatory within days. We can also see a group of people who are believed to have the parasite about to be executed by a firing squad. We are told that vital services like water and electricity have begun to fail. He tells us that he has heard of infestations in Europe and Australia, and that the seed is growing with remarkable speed. All of this has allowed him to understand something about humanity. Man is an animal, driven by animal passions, and that civilization is a pathetic charade of manners, predicated on a tissue-thin veil of lies. He goes on to say that in the future, if there is one, historians may blame our futures on some external cause, like the aliens, bio-national, or fate. But he knows the truth. Those things didn't kill them. They killed themselves. He explains that the military has organized off-world ships to evacuate vital personnel to the outer colonies. They are essentially saving themselves and leaving the planet to its own fate. Orina tells us that he has actually chosen to remain behind. He tells us that they had made the mistake of perceiving the aliens as sentient warriors. He finally realized the truth. That they're a disease. A cancer. He says that years ago, following surgery for cancer, doctors would apply radiation to the affected area in the hope of destroying all traces of the scourge. He goes on to say that it sounds so primitive, but there are times when the old ways are the most effective. Meanwhile, we can see soldiers in a nuclear bunker preparing to detonate their arsenal. He explains that he has timed the explosion of the nukes to coincide with the military's escape. He goes on to say that they think they can destroy the creatures and will be able to come back to Earth someday. 
Newt and Hicks are watching this message play out as an alien breaks into his office. Orina picks up a gun and tells us that he's never actually fired one of these before shooting himself in the head. Hicks starts slamming into the wall yelling, damn them, damn them all to hell. <laughs> this is a direct reference to Charlton Heston's line at the end of the original, Planet of the Apes. Hicks goes on to say that they thought they could breed the monsters, but the monsters were actually breeding them. Newt tells him that they have to go back and Hicks reassures her that it is over and that they are helpless. Newt grabs him and says, you were right, we are helpless. She points to the space jockey and says, it's not. We can see the lander taking off. Newt tells us that destroying the aliens had been an all-consuming passion for Hicks, yet they all felt a small sense of achievement as they left the rendezvous with the Benedict. We are told that the space jockey watched and approved their actions, as in the end, revenge was just another chemical reaction, like all things in life. One instant, there was a hive. The next, it was gone, as we see a huge nuclear blast level the structure to ash. Hicks finally agrees that they have to go back to Earth, and we see him starting the Benedict up for launch. Newt explains that they were nothing when they left Earth. They had been sent to find specimens, but were now returning with salvation. She enters the medical bay and calls out for Beulah. She approaches him and asks if he is alright. Beulah looks away and tells her not to look at him. She comes closer and says that she needed to know if what they had was real. Beulah says that when that thing tore into him, all he could think of was her. Newt tells him that Hicks believed this was all programming, part of some socialization process that he believed he was human because it was easier that way. Imagine thinking that you're a human being, only to discover that you're a synthetic upon being ripped in half. Newt wipes his fluid off with a cloth and explains that as she touched him, his skin was warm and soft, and that to her, he was essentially alive. She says that it comes back down to the arrogance of scientists who blurred the lines between man and machine. She confirms that it doesn't matter to her, as Beulah cared for her. After two weeks, we can see that the Benedict has finally reached Earth, alongside the space jockey who followed them in his ship. On the planet, the soldiers are getting ready for their launches into the outer colonies. One of them tells his commander that the creatures have breached the Galveston security line. One of the communications guys also tells them that they have picked up two ships on the DS scanners. One of them is unidentified, but the other appeared to be called the Benedict and is trying to hail them for a landing. The commander realizes this is Stephen's ship and tells him to grant them permission to land. As they descend onto the platform, Newt tells us that the rain battered their ship, almost as if nature was rebelling against the military's plans. The commander tells Hicks that one of the bio-national executives told them about Stephen's and that he didn't have to worry about those bastards anymore. Hicks is trying to talk to him about the message Orin had transmitted two weeks earlier about a mass detonation and says that they need to stop it. He tries to explain that there may be another way as we look out at the space jockey's ship which is above the planet. The commander tells Hicks that they have suspected the existence of other sentient beings since the Nostromo mission, but it didn't change anything. He tells Hicks that the aliens have won and that basic military tactics dictated that when you were outgunned, you retreat and leave nothing for the enemy. Hicks grabs him by the collar and flings him against the wall, saying he wasn't listening to what he was saying. There is essentially still another chance if they can call off the detonation. Newt realizes that they don't want to stop it, as the commander explains it's only a matter of time before the aliens overrun them. He says that they have to deal with the reality of the situation, and urges him to see it as Orina did, not as an alien attack, but as an opportunity. He elaborates by saying that the Earth has been on the brink of destruction for decades, and that there was no discipline or order. He tells us that this is a chance to clean the slate and start again. He goes on by saying that after a few years, when it's over, the survivors can return and terraform Earth into something beautiful again. Newt begins to laugh hysterically, as she tells us that Orina had been right. The aliens didn't destroy them, they destroyed themselves. A few soldiers rush in to tell the commander that there had been a breach on the southern perimeter and that they had spotted hundreds of aliens heading for them. He orders his men to lock the ships down and prepare for launch as it was time. Hicks asks what will happen to them and is informed that they are like everyone else on Earth who is still alive. They are unnecessary. Hicks grabs Newt and says that he will not give those alien shits the pleasure of killing them. He is planning on smuggling her onto one of the ships again 
but Newt tells him to wait and pulls him into the rehabilitation labs. As they enter, they can see that the androids had been stripped for parts and disassembled. Bueller then yells out saying that he didn't think that they would come back. We see them heading outside, with Newt carrying the top half of Bueller. Hicks is trying to identify a ship that didn't have any crew. We see them locate one, and also witness the aliens begin to overrun the military base. Hicks and Newt get on board a cargo ship called the American. Hicks tells them that they got lucky, as most of these cargo ships have been retrofitted for total auto operation. But this one still had some manual controls. Newt tells us that she wasn't aware what Hicks was thinking when they jumped on board the cargo ship, or whether he was just reacting as the soldier within him began to take control. She then says that maybe, after all they had witnessed, something finally sparked inside him, something precious, his will to live. We head to the command ship where orders are being given out to launch. The general tells his pilot that he was proud of all of his men, especially those who were still trying to get on board, but warns that if he did not prepare for launch, he will be shot on the spot. Newt is holding on to Beulah as she tells us that she could hear gunfire and screams, all the sounds of a dying planet. She then tells us that the automatic launch sequences and the whine of the ship's engines quickly drowned out the horror below. Newt then gets a message from the space jockey and says that she can see. Hicks asks her what's wrong as she explains that the jockey understood about Orina and his twisted plan. She thought it shared their thirst for vengeance and that they led it to Earth in the mistaken belief that it had wanted to help them. She asks how could they have been so blind? It shared so many of the mercurial human emotions like hate, anger, but also possessed the desire to conquer. She tells us that it no longer cared about the aliens. Its interests had shifted to the soldiers, who assumed that they would return one day to terraform Earth for themselves. She tells us that it would watch and wait for them to return. Newt also explains that it wanted her to know this. We see the cargo ship blast off as we are told its navigational computers were locked onto a deep space trajectory. The gravity drive pulsed like a living thing, propelling them across billions of miles of space. Newt tells us that Hicks had finally had his revenge, but found no satisfaction from it. When he began, he blamed his misery on the aliens. Now, all he could blame was himself. She tells us that she stood at one of the viewports staring into space. The light from the stars stretched around the ship like glowing white neon, but this time it was different. She wasn't alone anymore, and maybe, finally, that was all that mattered. And that is the end of the first book, Outbreak, in the first chapter of the huge Alien Omnibus series. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and to subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. I'm Niat with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.